Think about it with me this morning. Your faith can fall into one of the following three categories. It can be cold, it can be lukewarm, or it can be hot. How you respond to Jesus determines, of course, in which category you fall. But before we consider this, let us close our eyes in prayer. Our Father in heaven, please forgive us our sins. Rain upon us the blessing of revelation from your holy, inspired and inerrant word. Please protect us from all error. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My text for today is Matthew chapter 19 verses 16 to 22. Let me read it to you. And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said to Jesus, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to Jesus, All these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? And Jesus said to him, If you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have a treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. God always blesses the reading of his word. The account of Jesus and the rich young ruler is, for me, simply riveting. The rich young ruler asked Jesus, what does he lack to inherit eternal life? In other words, what good deed must he still perform to get a passing mark? You see, this rich ruler was laboring under the false impression that you earn your salvation. You work for it. But Jesus is about to show him that earning salvation is not an available option. You cannot earn heaven like wages. Salvation is about relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It is essentially a love affair and not a business transaction. You see, this young man was in love with his money and his possessions. He was not in love with God. And to show him this, Jesus tells him he must sell everything, give it to the poor, then he will have a treasure in heaven. But the rich young ruler just cannot get that right. He cannot do it. He just loves his money and his possessions too much. And he is therefore unable to enter the kingdom. And he walks away grieving, sad. Now here's the thing that really fascinates me about this account. And it is this, that Jesus does not run after this young man. Jesus has answered him has laid down the requirement, and it is now for the rich young ruler to respond. If he wants salvation, he must transfer his love from money and possessions to God. He will have to, if you think about it, this young man, realign his entire life. He's going to have to rip up the foundations. And I know this, it will not be easy. It will definitely be painful. The fact is that in every age, responding to Jesus' words includes pain on every level before there will be any substantial breakthrough in spiritual life. This truth, the reality of pain in following Jesus and actually responding to his words, seems to be lost in our day. Responding to Jesus hurts and we need to face this before we can move in any proper direction. Every word that Jesus speaks to us demands a response. 
His words land on us in the same way that they landed on the rich young ruler. We are in no way different. And I wonder to myself how many times I have, spiritually speaking, walked away sad and grieving without responding to Jesus. Jesus' words always reveal my heart and my true affections. I'm sure that is true for you. Sometimes I wish I could close my ears or tear out the page from the Bible. You see, over time I have learnt that deeply within me I love myself immensely. I want to put myself first. And then Jesus comes along and tells me to love my enemies and to put others first. And Jesus tells me to be the least when I long for recognition. And he tells me to lose my life when I feel I have just started to make sense of it at age 50. You see, his words are always sweet release, but they always demand a response, and that response is always most dreadfully serious and costly. I am convinced we need to be more serious. We need to quieten down and turn our thoughts to God. I was reading last week in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, I read this in verse 1b. Listen to this. The day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. I repeat, the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. When I read that, it resonated in me like a church bell being struck really hard. What this verse means is that bereavement over the death of someone is better than happiness over the birth of a child because bereavement is more effective in prodding and pushing one to contemplating the meaninglessness of this life and then responding to the only one who can give meaning and that one is God. You see death is always a wake-up call because life is a serious matter and we have very little time. What I read here in Ecclesiastes seems to me to be a bit out of line with the happy hype of the church of our day. But in fact, it is the happy hype of the church of our day that is out of line, out of step. Surely I should, and you should, be deeply affected by our lack of response to the words of Jesus. My lack of response should surely leave me with less words before God, less hype than anything more. It should break my heart. James says the following in chapter 4, verses 8 to 10 of the book of James. And, and this text seems so strange within the New Testament, but it is incredibly important. He says the following, Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. Now D.A. Carson makes a profound observation. He says the following, There is this kind of evil that is not very bad and not very good, not too terribly rebellious, yet not hungry for righteousness, a stance that drifts towards idolatry and hastily retreats at the threat of judgment. In other words, what D.A. Carson is saying is there is a kind of evil that is called a lukewarm faith. It is a faith that is neither hot nor cold. It is not terribly sinful, yet in the same breath it's not terribly hungry for God. A faith that easily drifts towards the temptations of this world and then quickly retreats when it senses God's judgment. A faith that has not yet responded to the words of Jesus. A faith that does not want any pain or discomfort. A faith that has not yet truly set its love on God above everything else. When the pleasant winds blow and things are going well, this kind of faith drifts away from God. But not far enough to lose complete connection. 
And then when the not so pleasant winds of troubles are blowing, then it drifts back to God again, but without any hunger for God or without it ending in any true connection with Him. Then again the pleasant winds blow and then there is a drifting away again from God. And this is the pattern of lukewarm faith and it is a kind of evil. We saw this in Rustenburg when the big strikes happened a few years ago. The church filled up, but it eventually emptied again. America saw it as well when 9-11 happened. The churches filled, but they eventually emptied again. We find another example of this pattern in 2 Chronicles 12 verse 1. We read the following. When the kingdom of Rehoboam was established and strong, Rehoboam, sorry, he and all Israel with him forsook the law of the Lord. That's a powerful verse. Rehoboam and the people of the southern kingdom did what God expected of them while they were still struggling. Until they were strong and then they abandoned God. Then God sends judgment and then there is a return by them to God. But the point from that text is that they never set their hearts on God. They didn't do that proper response. And in verse 14, the final evaluation of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, is this. It's recorded as follows. Let me read. He, that is Rehoboam, did evil because he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. He did evil because he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. He did not respond just like the rich Young ruler did not respond. He did not choose to set his heart on God. The same choice, the very same choice, is presented to each and every one of us. We must choose to do this. It is a decision. And we have to ask whether we have made that decision. King David is an example of a man who set his heart on God. You can hear it from his writings. Listen to him in Psalm 18. He writes the following, King David. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Listen to King David again in Psalm 62. This is beautiful. My soul waits in silence for God only. From Him is my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be greatly shaken. He has roots, and those roots are firmly planted in God upon whom he has established his love. Here is another example. Listen to the sons of Korah in Psalm 60 or 42. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. I hope you see this, that the language of a man or a woman who has decided to set his or her heart on God is different. It is the language of relationship, not business. Is this your language? Is your heart set on God? Have you responded to the words of Jesus? I close. Either I respond to the words of Jesus or I walk away like the rich young ruler. Either I respond to the words of Jesus or I find myself in the drifting emptiness of a lukewarm faith. This I know. The cost of responding to the words of Jesus is huge. Let no one tell me otherwise. Before I decide to respond, I must first 
count the cost. For responding to Jesus carries pain. It carries disruption. It always makes me vulnerable. It is never easy. And it is often downright scary. But this is the truth. I will not find life if I'm not willing to pay this price. There will be no breakthrough unless I do this. I do not want my faith to be cold. I do not want my faith to be lukewarm. I want it to be as hot as a heated iron. I want the faith that responds in heart and action to the words of Jesus. So help me God. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we ask that you would awaken us to the words of your Son, Jesus Christ. That you would give us the courage to respond. Set our faith on fire by your Holy Spirit that we may burn with zeal for you. Our hearts set on you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.